that's the sound I was talking about earlier when I said I got the, the jump sound working. Anyways, I should not be playing with my synthesizers. I should be helping you with your solution video for the stats assignment this week. I'm just about to put that together now and um, get it uploaded by the end of Friday. Hi everybody, back at the desk. I'm gonna try out flipping between uh, this kind of camera view and the screenshot a little bit and see how that works. Hopefully it's mildly more interesting. And uh, yeah, let me go to our studio and get set up for the lab solutions. All right, here we are back at lab five. I made a new R markdown and we have two questions, but I actually added a third bonus question too. And if you want to do that one, go for it. So all these questions, uh, let's take a look at them. So we're asked to consider a design with three groups and 10 people per group. And we're going to assume that the dependent variable is uh, normally distributed. And we're going to use a nor uh, unit normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So the first question is create simulated data for the above design that could be produced by the null that results in an F value smaller than the critical value for F in this design. Report the ANOVA, show a ggplot of the means in the simulated data, and uh, display the individual data points on top of the means. And then say what, whether you'd reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is go back to the the lab five, scroll up a little bit. You could find this code off the website. I'm looking for um, some of the code where we defined some simulated data and then ran some simulations. So I'm just gonna take this piece right here and pop it right in. This code can help us solve the problem. Now, we want to have a design with three groups, so I'm going to change the levels here to three, and we want to have 10 people per group. All right, we're going to use the normal, uh, the unit normal distribution here, and I think we've just accomplished s some of this. So three, 10, random data. I need, I need the tibble call in there. Boom, 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 boom. Let's see our random data. Okay, we have three groups. We have 30 subjects. We've got some random data sampled in there. Fantastic. Now, part of the question is, let's um, find an example where the F value is smaller than the critical value for F in this design. Okay. So what is the critical value for F in this design? Uh, let's find that part out. I'm going to say critical F and we can use the QF, I think for this, we want to know um, what F value, um, uh, we want to know the F value in the distribution um, that would, <laughs> oh my God, sorry, the F value uh, where 95% of uh, the values below that are in the distribution or 5% of the F values would be higher than that. So uh, we have three groups. That means our degrees of freedom in the numerator is two. And uh, we have 30 people and three group means. So we're gonna do uh, 27 for the denominator degrees of freedom. So our critical F should be 3.35, it looks like. Now this isn't part of the question, but if we just wanted to quickly see what kind of F distribution we're dealing with, we could plot a histogram of it, um, but eh, we'll skip that part. So our critical F that we're looking for, 3.35. Um, now, what we want to do is create some simulated data and have it be the case that for that particular set of data, 
we run the ANOVA and we find an F value that is smaller than 3.35. So it's, it's possible that this set of random data that we just made is already like that. So let's run the ANOVA. I'm gonna look at the summary of it. And what happened here? Our F value was 0.35, great. So that worked. I mean, we could use this random data. Um, I'd like to guarantee, make a guarantee though, because every time I press play or knit this, the numbers will be randomly different and I won't necessarily know that I got an F value less than the critical value. So I'm gonna delete this little part here and I'm gonna make use of the code that we were using for our simulations before. Now, this code is set to run um, a thousand times. It's, it's set to re-randomize these numbers a thousand times, resample from the same distributions. So what we could do is think about um, making our, uh, you know, sample random numbers a bunch of times, compute the ANOVA, and, you know, when we find an example that meets the criterion we're looking for, we could just save that data and exit the loop. So let's think about doing something like that. Um, so all we really need to do here, I think, is ask the question. Let's use a logic statement. Let's ask the question, uh, is the simulated F, like the one that we obtain from this data, so if simulated F is less than critical F, let's do something. Let's break. So that will break this loop. Uh, let's try it. Um, if you remember before, when we ran this, it took a little while, but it went pretty fast here. We could even ask the question, what value is I? <laughs> I is one. So it didn't even go through very many, it just did this one time. And we were lucky enough to have a set of data that produced an F value smaller than the critical value. So that's great. I'm actually going to delete this part here. So the code is a little cleaner. We don't need to save the F values. I'm going to make a comment repeat until we find the data that meets the criterion. So if we press play here, uh, we assume that we've probably found what we're looking for. We could change this loop. I mean, it's, it's possible that you could do this a thousand times and you would never get a simulated F value that was smaller than the critical value. That would be pretty unlikely to ever happen, but it could happen, so this loop won't guarantee that you get what you're looking for. So you could change the loop, but we'll leave it, uh, you could change it to a while loop or something like that. But I think for our purposes, this should be okay. Um, so I press play, we ran through that. If I was to look at the summary of this, we should see that uh, there is an F value smaller than the critical value, so that's true. Great. Let's go back up to the question. Now, what we want to do is report the ANOVA and show a ggplot of the means in the simulated data. Okay, so this will report the ANOVA and show a graph. Let's do that. I just went ahead and added the ggplot. So we have that code right here. You can take a look at it. 
we are going to use the summary and the mean function for the, the bar. And so we've got these three bars representing the means of this data. And I also added the point, the young point, so we could see the individual dots. Was there anything else here? I think that was it. So the question is, would you reject the null hypothesis in this situation? And would you be incorrect or correct in rejecting the null? I'll leave that part up to you to think about. However, what we can see now is we've, we've got a situation set up where, let's say I knit this document, let's check that out. So it's gonna put the code there. And every time we run this simulation, it's going to stop and essentially save the data in place such that the F value will be smaller than the critical value. And we can plot the data to see what what that simulated data happened to look like. So if you're curious what m some means would look like and what the data points would look like, when the F value is smaller than the critical value, you could run this a bunch of times and take a look at the graphs to get a feeling for it. All right, so why am I doing this? I, I'm basically thinking that uh, it's good to get some experience um, seeing what data looks like when it comes from the null hypothesis. So remember in this simulation, we set it such that the dependent variable is always coming from a normal distribution. That means um, there should not be any differences between the groups that are due to the manipulation. It's, it's just due to random sampling into the different groups. So in the second question, uh, what we want to look at is kind of the opposite. What happens if we get sample data through this null hypothesis process that uh, produces an F value that's larger than the critical F value. I mean, this can happen too. We've assumed an alpha of 0.05, so this kind of thing should only happen 5% of the time. Let's use the same strategy we just made to guarantee that we can find simulated data from the null that produces uh, F values larger than the critical. Okay, I hope that these uh, little macro keys that I'm pressing are allowing me to flip between the different YouTube, the, the different camera views. Hopefully that's working out. So that's the second question. It's exactly the same as the first, and we just want to find data where the F value is larger than the critical value. So this should be pretty easy for us now that we solved the first problem. We can simply copy all of this and it, uh, right now I would like the simulated F value to be larger than the critical F value. Now it's possible that if I try to find this uh, a thousand times I will never find it. So let's, um, I'd like to just report the answer just so that when I print it out, I can, I can know for sure. I mean, I, I guess I'll be able to look at the summary ANOVA here, but let's, let's see what happens if, if all we do is really just change the symbol so that the loop will break when the simulated F value is actually larger than the critical F value. So let's run that. It happened. I'm curious what I is, because that will tell us how many times it had to resample. So, oh, it only happened, it happened right away here. It happened to be the second time. Um, let's press play again. See if it took longer that time. 13, it only took 13 times. And we found an F value larger than the critical value. Okay. Um, that's cool. It's maybe a little bit nicer to look at this when we're knitting the document instead of looking at it over here. So uh, let's check check it out. So it's true. Great. The ANOVA. Here's the ANOVA result. And 
Oh, look, an F value of 4.187. That's larger than the critical value. So what does the data look like here? Yeah. All right, so remember all of these data points were sampled from the very same normal distribution. And if you were to look at these, uh, I don't know, this, this is the kind of data that might convince you there was an effect that was actually there, even though the numbers were all taken from a, a, the very same normal distribution. Let's knit it again to see if we can see, see what we can see. Um, interesting. So apparently those would, uh, how about this? An F value of 4.36. Yeah, well, this is giving you a sense of uh, what data kind of looks like that would essentially lead you to type one errors. All right. Um, let's think about the very last question. I put a bonus question in here. When we were talking about the ANOVA assumptions in, in lab, we did a few different simulations where we took numbers from non-normal distributions. Now the ANOVA assumes that the numbers in your analysis are coming from a normal distribution. And it turns out that the ANOVA is relatively robust, sorry, to these, to violations of those assumptions. So if we took numbers from some other distribution, uh, we could compute an F value and we could see what the F distribution would look like under those other assumptions. And what we saw was that they looked pretty similar. Uh, I fooled around with this for a little while just for fun and had a hard time finding ways to make the F distribution break. And I tweeted about it a little bit and some nice folks on Twitter uh, gave me some, some clues about how you could do this. So uh, let's check it out. Let's see if we can break the F distribution in the bonus question. Okay. Okay, so the bonus question is basically this. Can you run a simulation that samples numbers from a non-normal distribution that does produce a very different looking F distribution? Let's, let's see if we can do it. So I'm gonna head, head over to the lab and let's go to where we're looking at simulating a null distribution in R, a null F distribution. This is basically the same code we just copied. Let's take this part where we were creating a distribution of simulated F values. I'm gonna copy that right in here and tab that over so it's a little easier to read. And if we scroll down just a little bit, there's a bit of code that takes the simulated F values and plots them against the some a thousand random deviates of a true F distribution. And so is a way I use to just kind of look and see if they're similar. So let's grab that too and copy that over. Now, if we run this, we basically should find the same two distributions because I am simulating the true null hypothesis. I'm simulating the idea that data is coming from a normal distribution. I'm gonna use this a little bit later, I think. So let's try this. Okay. Um, some of this is a little off in that uh, we want our levels to be whatever number. So the levels here, this should be levels minus one for those degrees of freedom. And this value is going to be something like the number of levels times n per level 
which is, you know, the total number of subjects here, that'd be 30. So the, the second degrees of freedom is the number of subjects minus the number of groups. All right, so we weren't computing the degrees of freedom properly there. Otherwise, I think we're good. Now, if we, I'm, let's try something a little different. So I'm gonna take away this histogram. I'm gonna do something called freak poly. And I'm gonna set the bins to 50. And I'm going to set the color to type. And let's run this again. Now, instead of a histogram, we are seeing kind of like a estimated distribution. And this is a easy way to just, you know, put the two things right on top of each other. So what I can see here, as it should be, is that the simulated distribution is pretty much overlapping with the, what I'm calling the analytic, the true F distribution. So uh, we have not chosen a normal distribution, or sorry, we have not chosen a non-normal distribution that will break the ANOVA. Let's do something like, I don't know, try the exponential distribution. That's not a normal distribution. So we could try that one. Uh, where is it? REXP, I think. There it is. So if you wanted to mess around with this, you could you could say, well, what does an exponential, say like a thousand numbers with a exponent one, what does that look like? Looks like that. All right, so that is not a normal distribution. What if we put that in here? REXP, we still want to sample a total of 30 numbers. Um, this formula or this function only has one parameter and we put a one there. So we're gonna be now basically sampling numbers from this kind of distribution into our random data. And I'm gonna put simulated EXP here. So, so does this work? Let's find out. Let's look at that ggplot. Hmm. I mean, they look pretty overlapping to me, don't you think? So sampling from that exponential distribution didn't really make a difference in the F distribution. So this is some of that evidence that the F distribution is resistant, robust to some violations. Now. Um, yeah, someone on Twitter said, why don't you try a Cauchy distribution? That's a T distribution with the degrees of freedom of one. And I was like, okay, let's try that. What is that? Let's try it out. Remember, we have a T distribution that we can sample from right here. And so if we wanted to see what a T distribution looks like, and we wanted to sample, let's just sample like 100,000 numbers from it. And normally, let's say maybe t degrees of freedom of nine or something, that might be a normal kind of thing. So it kind of looks like a normal distribution, one that we're familiar with. When you set the degrees of freedom to one, you get some very different things. So let's only sample 100 numbers here. So this this distribution is centered on zero, like other T distributions, but there's some kind of big, ran randomly big numbers here. Let's, let's do this again. Um, you can see that, so what, what the hell, <laughs> you know, there's like a negative 800 pops in. Like, so this distribution is really kind of an interesting one. It is mostly around zero with sometimes just really big, really rare numbers that pop in there. We can see that if, if we sample 10,000 numbers, you know, we, we're getting randomly a few numbers out in the negative 5,000 or 5,000. Every time we do this, the things that we're getting are very strange. So most of the stuff is 
it, it's we're, it's kind of like thinking like most of the data is coming from one distribution and some there's some random outliers once in a while. So let's try this. Let's let's imagine the data that we had that we were sampling into our groups was coming from this kind of distribution. So we set this to RT and we're going to use a degrees of freedom of one. We're going to sample this many people and we're going to press play. We're going to compute that F distribution and take a look at it. I'm going to actually, I'm going to call this simulated T1. Let's do that instead. All right. So as you can see here, there's now definitely a shift. So we have successfully done something. We've made, we've shown that the F distribution can change a little bit. It's not totally robust to all violations or to, to any um, other distribution. I'm not saying this very well. You can make funny looking F distributions if you change the numbers that go into the computation. And one way to do that is use something like a Cauchy distribution. Okay, so for the, for the bonus question, you could find any type of distribution besides this one. And you're basically looking to show something like this, where the F distribution that you obtain really doesn't overlap very well with the one that you're expected to get from the normal distribution. Okay, so we did it. It's Friday at 4.30. Have a good weekend, and we'll see you next week. Uh, I hope to get this uploaded as soon as possible. And yeah, like I said, see you next time.